Sometimes all it takes to get a response from your elected officials is a massive class action lawsuit. <laughs> Viva Fry, Montreal litigator turned YouTuber, and by now you've probably all heard of CHAZ, which was the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone, renamed to CHOP, which was the Capitol Hill organized protest, basically a portion of Seattle that was either abandoned to or occupied by protesters. Take it for what it's worth, Wikipedia describes it as follows. The Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone, CHAZ, also known as Free Capitol Hill, the Capitol Hill Occupied Protest, and the Capitol Hill Organized Protest, CHOP, was an occupation protest and self-declared autonomous zone in the Capitol Hill neighborhood of Seattle, Washington, United States. The zone originally covering six city blocks and a park, was established on June 8, 2020 by George Floyd protesters after the Seattle Police Department left its East Precinct building and was cleared of occupants by police on July 1, 2020. I am making this vlog on July 1, 2020, Canada Day in Canada, and something Wikipedia fails to mention is that CHOP was only cleared of the protesters on July 1, 2020 after a massive class action lawsuit was filed against the city of Seattle. The class action lawsuit was filed against the city of Seattle by various businesses and entities that exist within the CHOP zone who have been utterly decimated by what has occurred within the CHOP zone over the last three weeks. The incident began when protesters basically took over the police station and the police, in an attempt to de-escalate the situation, basically abandoned the police station to the protesters. The police abandoned not only the police station but an entire area and the protesters who had once occupied only the police station basically occupied an entire area which became known as CHAZ or CHOP. And the lawsuit itself, which reads like something out of someone's nightmares, doesn't just allege that the city didn't do anything. It alleges that the city actively participated in the deprivation of the constitutional rights of the plaintiffs. Now, a couple of things I've said in the past, and I will say again in the future, an overly litigious society has its pros and its cons. Its cons are frivolous lawsuits, people walking on eggshells for fear of getting sued. Its pros are that at some point in time, it does tend to hold people accountable for their wrongdoing. Another thing I've said that when it comes to the field of law, sometimes people file a lawsuit not for the purposes of winning, but just for the purposes of telling their story to the public. And this is one of those stories where the plaintiffs just want to tell their story to the public. That and possibly collect a fat check for grotesque government misconduct, even if that fat check comes from taxpayer dollars. But I do believe the primary objective of the plaintiffs is to tell their story, so let's read their story. In the United States District Court for the Western District of Washington, class action complaint, jury demand. Hunter Capitals LLC, Northwest Liquors and Wine LLC, SRJ Enterprises, The Richmark Company, Therapy PLLC, Kathleen Caples, Onyx Homeowners Association, and the list goes on and on and on. On behalf of themselves and others similarly situated. And we will explain in greater detail what that means later on in this vlog, but basically they're talking for and on behalf of the potential class of plaintiffs. Overview. The rights of free speech and to peaceably assemble are enshrined in our constitutional tradition. Plaintiffs support free speech rights and support the efforts of those like Black Lives Matters who, by exercising such rights, are bringing issues such as systemic racism and unfair violence against African Americans by police to the forefront of the national consciousness. Specifically, plaintiffs support the free speech rights of many of those who have gathered on Capitol Hill to form what has been called CHAZ, standing for the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone or CHOP for the Capitol Hill Organized Protest or Capitol Hill Occupying Protest. This lawsuit does not seek to undermine CHOP participants' message or present a counter-message. Rather, this lawsuit is about the constitutional and other legal rights of plaintiffs, businesses, employees, and residents in or around CHOP who have been overrun by the City of Seattle's unprecedented decision to abandon and close off an entire city neighborhood, leaving it unchecked by the police, unserved by fire and emergency health services, and inaccessible to the public at large. The city's decision has subjected businesses, employees, and residents of that neighborhood to extensive property damage, public safety dangers, and an inability to use and access their properties. These first two paragraphs are heavy with politics and the plaintiffs are walking a very fine line between not wanting to anger the people or entities that have caused the damage while suing the city for the damage caused by those people. The plaintiffs are affirming that they support the causes, they support people's right to protest while simultaneously suing the city for abandoning the entire area and allowing these protests to run amok. The plaintiffs are sort of caught between a rock and a hard place in that they want to sue to avail themselves of their rights to be compensated for the damage that they have suffered without angering people further to result in even greater damage to them. Not a position anyone would want to find themselves in, but let's move on with this lawsuit. On June 8, 2020, the city of Seattle abruptly deserted the Seattle Police Department's East Precinct on the corner of 12th Avenue and East Pine Street in the Seattle's Capitol Hill neighborhood, leaving behind numerous barriers that had previously been used as a line between police and protesters. When the city abandoned the precinct and the nearby barriers, a number of individuals who had been in the area took control of the barriers and used them to block off streets in an area around the East Precinct. In the days and weeks after the city abandoned the East Precinct, 
shop participants have occupied the public streets, sidewalks, and parks in the area at all hours of the day and night. Rather than seeking to restore order and protect the residents and property owners within CHOP, the city instead chose to actively endorse, enable, and participate in the occupation of CHOP. And this is the crux of the lawsuit. It is not only a question of the city failing to protect, it is a question of the city actively participating in contributing to the damage. The city has provided Cal Anderson Park, a public park located at the center of CHOP, to CHOP for use as the staging ground supporting CHOP's occupation of the surrounding area. Supported by the city, countless CHOP participants now reside in the park at all times of day and night, having turned it into a tent city. At any given time, hundreds of CHOP participants are camped out in the park. The city's conduct has resulted in CHOP being blocked off from public access. Among other conduct detailed below, the city recently provided the participants with concrete barriers to use to block the streets, which CHOP participants have indeed used to barricade the streets and create borders. These borders have, at times, been guarded by armed CHOP participants who oversee who can or cannot enter CHOP. As a result, these streets are barred to most all vehicular traffic, making it virtually impossible for residents and businesses to access their buildings, receive deliveries, and provide goods and services to the few customers willing to enter CHOP. And when I say that sometimes people file lawsuits just to tell their story, I have a sneaking suspicion the plaintiffs in this lawsuit are filing this lawsuit to tell their story because you sure as heck don't see the mainstream media describing CHOP like this. <laughs> And the description of the mayhem goes on. It will be redundant for me to read it, but I'm going to include a link to the lawsuit in the pinned comment so you can read it all for yourself if you so choose. Let's just move on to the conclusions of the introductory paragraphs. Plaintiffs and others have repeatedly pleaded with Mayor Durkin and others to cease enabling the destruction of their property and the imminent dangers posed to them and their neighborhood. But the city has not listened or has not cared, and plaintiffs have had to resort to litigation to make themselves heard. Again, this case is not about plaintiffs' agreement or disagreement with the inspiration for CHOP or the viewpoints exposed by the people occupying occupying that area. Instead, it is about the city's active, knowing endorsement and support of a destructive occupation of a neighborhood to the detriment of the well-being of those who live and work in that neighborhood. Again, walking that fine line between availing yourself of your rights to sue for damages without instigating additional damages for having availed yourself of your rights to sue. And again, having your story heard because the city didn't do anything, the media is not reporting on it, so the last resort is the court of law. And then we get into the description of the parties. I'm going to read the intro paragraph and not read the stories of each and every one of them. I'm just going to go to the highlights to to illustrate what this CHOP situation is all about for the people living in CHOP. Plaintiffs are residents, tenants, property owners, and small businesses in Seattle's Capitol Hill neighborhood that have been harmed by CHOP. Without an injunction restraining the city from continuing its policies of supporting and enabling the occupation of the CHOP area, each of the plaintiffs will continue to suffer irreparable harm by, among other things, being subject to acts of violence, harassment, trespass, and vandalism, denial of access to their property, loss of police protection and public services, including trash, medical, and fire services, loss of business revenue, loss of the use of public streets, sidewalks, and parks near or adjacent to their property, residence, or premises, reduction of property value, destruction of property, and other economic and non-economic injuries. We have talked about injunctions at length in previous vlogs. You have your sort of emergency injunctions, which are temporary restraining orders. You have provisional, temporary, interlocutory, permanent injunctions. Injunctions are orders of the court enjoining someone to do or to not do something. But as far as the issue of an injunction in this particular case, it has become somewhat academic because of the fact that the city has now dismantled CHOP and the the sole remaining question presumably is going to be a question of damages for the injury suffered by the plaintiffs. Dude, you're interfering with my business here. Can you please leave my office? You can leave my office through the window. Here, got one more piece of cheese. Go, get out. Now that CHOP has been dismantled by the police, the question of the injunction is going to be somewhat academic. It's going to be a question of the damages suffered by the plaintiffs. Then we go through brief descriptions of all the plaintiffs, which I'm going to skip over. You can read it for yourselves, but basically they are individual small businesses who want nothing more than the peaceable enjoyment of their property. Then we get back into the factual allegations surrounding the creation of CHOP, which we all already know. And although allegations are nice, a picture is worth a thousand words. Ever since the SPD vacated Capitol Hill, the CHOP participants Participants have claimed the area as their own with a physical presence and a loose form of governance and justice. CHOP participants have maintained borders with barriers and people patrolling the perimeter as well as vehicles parked in the middle of rights of way. Many CHOP participants live on the streets and sidewalks and in Cal Anderson Park in tents such as the following. <laughs> They have painted graffiti on most available surfaces, and if a property owner paints over the graffiti, the graffiti is typically replaced within a few hours. CHOP participants have even threatened business owners with retaliation if they paint over graffiti. Examples of this pervasive graffiti include the following. 
lawsuit goes on to describe how the residents can no longer use Cal Anderson Park because it has been overrun as a sort of tent city, and they include photographs to prove that. CHOP participants have even built makeshift gardens on the park's lawns to grow food for CHOP. The city has handed over public property in the park for this use, as shown here. And the idea that the city has gifted public property to the CHOP participants is going to come up later to justify one of the causes of action of the plaintiffs. The lawsuit then goes on to describe the effects of CHOP on the plaintiffs and the class as a whole. The impacts on plaintiffs and the class have been extensive. The experiences of each plaintiff are described in detail below. However, all plaintiffs and class members have in common at least the following harms. A lack of public safety, assistance, and substantially impaired access to and use of their properties. The city's endorsement and recognition of CHOP has gone so far that the SPD has adopted a policy and practice of not entering the area except in the case of life-threatening crimes. And even then, the SPD response is weak and delayed. Then the lawsuit goes on to describe two actual incidents of shootings within CHOP. At approximately 2.20 a.m. on June 20, 2020, there were two people shot in CHOP. At least one of the shootings happened at or near the intersection of 10th Avenue and Pine Street around the corner from the abandoned East Precinct. One of the victims died before reaching the hospital. The second was admitted with life-threatening injuries. No suspects have been identified or taken into custody. On June 21, 2020, another shooting occurred in the area at approximately 11 at night. There was no police or medic response, and the shooting victim was transported to the emergency room by private vehicle. And again, it's not just a question of the fact that the city has allegedly failed in its duty to protect. It's a question of the fact that the city and its mayor have actively contributed to the destruction. The city has actively supported and encouraged CHOP and CHOP participants. In the face of all this destruction, city leaders, including Mayor Durkin, have embraced the existence, message, and methods of CHOP and CHOP participants. They have done this with physical support and extensive verbal support and encouragement that has expressly endorsed the barricading and occupation of city streets and parks. And to eliminate any lingering doubt, Mayor Durkin actually did an interview on CNN with Chris Cuomo where she described what was going on in CHOP as a block party. Good to see you, Chris. Glad you're back and healthy. Thank you. Thank you for the good word. Uh, so I don't have to tell you about the situation on the ground in your city, uh, but in terms of how it looks to the rest of the country and the president uh, teeing it up as basically ineptitude, the ability, inability to control your own streets, is that fair criticism? So I know it will shock you that the president is perhaps not giving an accurate or truthful picture. Um, we've got four blocks in Seattle that you just saw pictures of that is more like a block party atmosphere. It's not an armed takeover. It's not a military junta. It's more like a block party atmosphere. It's more like a block party atmosphere. It's more like a block party atmosphere. Right after I saw Cuomo's interview with Durkin, I immediately tweeted, this interview is not going to age well. When you know you are going to be sued as Durkin ought to have known, you have to watch what you say in public because it will be used against you. Durkin's behavior and public statements on the issue show that she was not just a passive observer of the entire situation. She was an active participant and she basically created a legal basis for the plaintiffs to sue. The right to challenge authority and government is fundamental to who we are as Americans. We do not need anyone, including the president, to try to sow further divide, further distrust, and misinformation. The threat to invade Seattle, to divide and incite violence in our city, is not only unwelcome, it would be illegal. It's not that the city didn't do anything. They actively participated in contributing to and facilitating the damage sustained by the plaintiffs. At least those are the allegations in the lawsuit. It will be up to a jury to decide whether or not that is in fact the case. Then we get into the description of the class because in a class action lawsuit, you have to be able to describe the class and you have to be able to create certain questions of law that apply pretty much equally to all members of the class. Plaintiffs seek to certify a class of similarly situated persons pursuant to federal rules of civil procedure 23B2 and or 23B3. The class is hereby defined as follows. All persons or entities who own property in, have a business in, or reside in the area in the city of Seattle bounded by the following streets. The definition of the class is unambiguous. Plaintiffs are members of the class and all members of the class can be identified through public records and notified by mail or other means of notification. Now, rules regarding class action lawsuits are jurisdictional. Nothing in this video constitutes legal advice. If you need legal advice, consult a lawyer in your proper jurisdiction. But when it comes to class action lawsuits, the class needs to be definable and clearly circumscribed. In order to certify the class, there can't be ambiguity as to who does and does not fit within the class. And the questions of fact and law have to be common to the class so defined. There are numerous questions of law and fact common to the class that predominate over any individual issues. These issues include the following. Whether the city has participated in, endorsed, or encouraged the creation, maintenance, and continued existence of CHOP. All facts regarding the existence and maintenance of CHOP including at least the following. The boundaries and nature of the SPD's no-go zone in and around CHOP. All facts and circumstances surrounding the city's participation in, endorsement of, or encouragement of the creation, maintenance, and continued existence of CHOP. The nature and scope of activities of CHOP participants. Whether plaintiffs and the class have legally protected constitutional property rights. 
whether the city has infringed on those property rights by its actions with regard to CHOP, whether the city was required to provide notice and a hearing to class members before infringing on those property rights. And it goes on and on and on. And then we get into the causes of action, the first of which is procedural due process. Plaintiffs and the class have constitutionally protected property rights as defined by Washington state law to exclude others from their property, to the use and quiet enjoyment of their property, and to access their property via public rights of way. The city has infringed on those rights, including by one, creating, assisting, endorsing, and encouraging an indefinite, unpermitted occupation and blockade of the public streets, sidewalks, and parks in and around CHOP, thereby denying plaintiffs access to their properties, and two, creating, assisting, endorsing, and encouraging the pervasive vandalism and trespasses against plaintiff's properties, thereby denying plaintiffs the ability to use their properties and exclude others from them. Again, it's not just that the city did nothing, it's that they actively participated in assisting CHOP participants, and Mayor Durkin was quite proud to say it all over social media. The right to challenge authority and government is fundamental to who we are as Americans. That is more like a block party atmosphere. The plaintiffs make the same claim for the third cause of action, violation to substantive due process. But the cause of action I find most interesting in this lawsuit is the unlawful gift cause of action. Unlawful gift. Article 8, Section 7 of the Washington State Constitution provides, quote, no county, city, town, or other municipal corporation shall hereafter give any money or property or loan its money or credit to or in aid of any individual, association, company or corporation, except for the necessary support of the poor and infirm, or become directly or indirectly the owner of any stock in or bonds of any association, company or corporation. In direct violation of Article 8, Section 7, the city has given away an interest in public property without consideration and with donative intent to CHOP participants. And now we are seeing the strategic importance of earlier allegations to the effect that the city gifted public property to the CHOP participants. As a direct and foreseeable result of the city gifting an interest in in public property to CHOP, plaintiff's injuries include but are not limited to deprivation of their use of that public property in Capitol Hill, the loss of police protection previously provided through the East Precinct, limitation on access to their private property, vandalism and trespass to their private property by CHOP participants, damage to property, a loss in property value, a loss of business revenue, and or other economic loss. These harms have been caused by CHOP participants residing in Cal Anderson Park and other public property ceded to them by the city. And then the fifth cause of action, taking. Plaintiffs and the class have constitutionally protected property rights to use and enjoy their properties, to exclude others from their properties, and to access their properties via public rights of way. The city has deprived plaintiffs of those rights by affirmatively creating, assisting, endorsing, and encouraging an indefinite, unpermitted invasion, occupation, and blockade of the public rights of way that provide access to plaintiffs' private properties, as well as by affirmatively creating, assisting, endorsing, and encouraging the physical invasion of plaintiffs' private properties by CHOP participants. The city has done so pursuant to city policy as created and ratified by city policymakers, including Mayor Durkin. Plaintiffs have not received compensation for the deprivation of their property rights. Then we have the standard prayer for relief at the end of the lawsuit. Now, if this lawsuit was weak to begin with, the conduct of Mayor Durkin in particular has certainly added strength to plaintiff's case. Very rarely can making public statements during an ongoing lawsuit help you in the context of that lawsuit. If Mayor Durkin didn't know that in all likelihood the city of Seattle was going to get sued as a result of what was going on in CHOP, she ought to have known, and to the extent that she ought to have known, she ought to have weighed her public statements accordingly. So that is the lawsuit. That is plaintiff's story. That is what they wanted the world to hear. Where is this lawsuit going? I don't know, but it's not going away anytime fast. That is my prediction. As far as I am concerned, given the substance of the factual allegations of this lawsuit, it is not getting prematurely dismissed. It will, unless it settles, proceed to a discovery which should be incredibly fascinating to watch. And the ultimate irony in all of this is that even if it does settle and the city cuts a fat check to the plaintiffs, it is cutting a fat check with the taxpayer dollars of the plaintiffs themselves. But sometimes the mere fact of having a jury of your peers say that you were right and that you suffered an injustice is priceless. And with that said, if you like my videos and you like my content, please be sure to like, share, subscribe, hit the notification bell, drop a comment in the comment section below because it feeds the algorithm and that merch shirt is on its way. If you want to support the channel, all of these support links are in the pinned comment. We've got merch, PayPal, Subscribestar, Patreon, YouTube membership where members get sneak peeks of the videos in as much as possible. Actually, Patreon and Subscribestar members get the same privilege. But above all else, take care of yourselves, check in on friends and family, make sure everyone around you is doing well. It is the summer, get out and get some fresh air and now you know your vlog. Peace out. Booyah.